Welcome to Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast, uh, where every week I'll be discussing the pitfalls of the music industry. Um, this week it's time to get down to business. Um, my producer, Jenny Mae Finn, is intrigued about how a band um, actually becomes a business and how does this affect uh, musicians as artists. Um, what, what is it that goes into running a band in order for it to succeed? Um, it is quite business oriented. However, as always, we go on some philosophical uh, tangential meanderings um, and some of it's related to you know the business side of music and some of it ends up being completely irrelevant but I, I really enjoyed this conversation because it was a bit more upbeat than I was expecting it to be you know there's a lot of um, ill feeling towards the business nature uh, or sorry the business side of, of music and, and how fickle and difficult it can be to navigate these things but uh, I hope that you'll glean some insights from it because I thought uh, Jenny and I did a, a reasonable job of uh, unpacking some of those questions. Um, anyway, you can listen to this podcast over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify um, if you don't want to watch all of it right now. Um, in the meantime, please, to enjoy. Okay. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again, The Jaws of Victory, Pitfalls of the Music Trade, featuring my producer and I, Jenny May Finn, and I. Um, I didn't bring my guitar either. A cappella? I've got one. Yeah, I've got one there. Why don't you play it? I don't know how to play it. Come off it. Get the guitar. <laughs> no, you can on. teach me how to play it. <laughs> I don't know what chords are. <laughs> yeah, but neither I don't do know I. What chords so start are. off on the fifth fret of the sixth string. <laughs> is this the sixth string? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the way I look at it. The sixth one is because it's the furthest away from you. If you count six away from you. That? John. Yep. <laughs> and then you go to the seventh fret of the fifth string. That? I can't see your fingers, uh. but. <laughs> and then you go to the eighth fret of the third string. <laughs> That's the oh, sorry, fourth string. <laughs> My bad. That? Just Hawkins <laughs> rides again. Give me an E minor. Again. <laughs> Beautiful, that's it. I tried. We got there in the end. Um, today's subject, according to a WhatsApp message from you earlier today, um, is... Yeah, it was yesterday. Was the WhatsApp yes message. Okay, I don't know what day it is. <laughs> today's, uh, well, the subject of today's um, long-form interview is going to be business <laughs> pitfalls of the music trade business as, yeah. uh, as illustrated by you and your whiteboard yeah i live so, my life on that whiteboard. why did why did you come up with that idea because people are always like i don't understand how it works what you do I and mean, whenever you talk about like contracts and labels and stuff yeah. people are intrigued it doesn't really work as reaction videos but people are fascinated by that stuff because they right. don't know how it works. Or, so, Is there like, any particular a, aspects of the business? Well, of I was music? thinking about it. I was thinking about when you first become a band, mm -hmm. when does it become a business? Because it starts off as music and band and then it turns into a business. And how does that transition happen? Ah, uh -huh, okay. How did it happen for you? That's a good question. I think at the beginning, there's no business involved. Because there's no money involved, and then when is, I suppose the the moment it becomes a business is when. Ah, oh, such a difficult question. If you're a band, then at some point, it's important to do what they call a partnership agreement, so that all the members of the band are protected, and you know collectively, you own the the name of the project. You know, I think there's a there's a lot of things to do with trademarking and copyrights and the, and the title of the thing itself you know that's, that's one of the most important uh things to establish ownership of and if you're a real band then it's kind of like that's the thing that you share and then you have sort of provisions in place as to like in the event of splitting up which members of the band if any are allowed to use the title of the band for their next project if you see what i mean when did you do that when do you do it? When do you talk about it? I think you do. Because uh, it, it kind of sours thing when you start when you start talking about contracts, isn't it? Uh, well, it has the potential to do that, yeah. But I think um, not if you sort of collectively recognise 
the, the one of the most important things is is uh, to have a piece of paper that lets everybody know that they're part of something. You know, I I seem to remember it being really good fun the first time we went to meet a real music lawyer. We went to this guy called uh, John Statham, and um, he had such a reputation of being such a badass that people used to call him the Chisel. So we were excited that that the Chisel was interested in representing us. Um, when was that though? That must have been. That really was early. Track, I mean, I think that was though, right? one of the first sort of. Was it when you were Empire or the the, the Darkness? I th you know what? It might have been just as we became a four piece. Um, so that would have been like the beginning of two thousand and one, I reckon. So it's before there was really anything to do. So like the first thing we had in place really was an excellent lawyer, and the first thing he had to do was draw up a, a partnership agreement to make sure that we all knew where we stood and who was who and. It was kind of like um, that felt businessy, but I think um, I think the real business stuff happens when you when you start touring, because then you find yourself a blind like if you when you start touring and start releasing stuff, it's important to see the band um, as a, as an entity that holds licenses, which is that's your recordings, you know. Like so, if you um, if you record an album. Uh, and then the record company wants to put it out, you grant them a license to do that. Um, and any sort of money that changes hands, you know, between the label and the band, that has to come into the, the license holding entity. So then that's one business. And then there's another business, which is the touring company. So that's, that's the thing that, that floats, uh, you know, you have your income, it might, they might cross pollinate, you might use income from like the, the label, uh, the license holding entity um, to fund the touring uh, and vice versa but they're two separate things and I think they're usually both limited companies um, and you've got so to get you've those got two businesses sorry so you're like you've got two businesses yeah every, every band I know of has two businesses the first one is why can't they be the same pardon why can't they be the same I think because one of them's primarily concerned with the touring arts and probably has different levels of tax exposure or something like that there's there's going to be a reason for it another one deals mostly in loans you know when you get when you get an advance on something that's an advance you know and it's got to be treated differently i think um it's important to have those business structures because otherwise you have an enormous personal sort of tax liability and exposure so, and, and at the end of the day, if somebody hurts themselves when they're working for the band, like, so, like say, for example, Softy falls off a ladder when he's uh, reaching... Or he gets hit by a giant tarpaulin on a stage and hurts his leg. Which is a thing that really did happen, <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that instance, rather than him taking all of our houses, uh, the insurances <laughs> held by the, the touring company would, would help to nurse Softy back to health and sew his leg back on, albeit back to front. But are you directors then of the business? Each, yeah, I think each, we're, all, each, we're all directors each member. of uh, both of those businesses, yeah. And each member. Do you get a salary or a dividend as a, as a band? Yeah, we get dividends, um, interim dividends, we get salaries. It's just like, it is exactly like being in a business, or doing a business, basically. Um, I thought when you were talking about business, I, I, I thought it was going to be talking about... Um, Publishing companies and stuff like that as well. well I've got loads of questions. You are? I haven't, I've got loads of questions. Have you? Have you written down a load of questions? I'm just getting in, just being a good interviewee and poking. Brilliant. Keep poking. Sorry about coughing. I'm ill, by the way. Oh, yeah. This is one thing that uh, Jenny asked me to do. I need to apologise on behalf of Jenny because she's been <laughs> ill for two days. <laughs> And I keep you said something you... about your eye. What's been going on with your eye? <laughs> no, I, you know, when you, you've got a sort of bad headache, it makes your eyes go a bit puffy <laughs> and closed. <laughs> you've got to see a doctor. <laughs> you've got a headache that's so bad, your eyes are popping out. That's not good. <laughs> I'm not used to being, and when I was driving back from Glastonbury, guess what I thought? No, I'm never ill. Is that what you thought? Yeah, I haven't been ill in like a year and a half. Famous last words. And then you got ill. Do you think that yeah. the, the thought was prompted by the fact that your body knew you were getting ill? I yeah, my body was like, <laughs> I'm just going to remind you. Because I felt great, emotionally great, physically horrendous. Ah, terrible combination. <laughs> Sorry, can't have both. It'll go back to the other way. No, soon. I'm the other way around. I'll be physically really great again and emotionally distraught soon, so that's fine. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. I bet there might be a day when they just... 
That was there was one day. Yeah. It was Tuesday. <laughs> you can, that was the one day of your life when you <laughs> when you were An in equilibrium. complete harmony between uh, physical pain and uh, emotional unrest. I woke up surprised. I woke up surprised. <laughs> I woke up feeling really just level and normal. I was like, <gasps> this is oh a very really unfamiliar feeling of. Uh, I was equilibrium. like, and the ne- next day I couldn't get up because I was so physically <laughs> in pain. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, yeah. back to your business. Well, anyway, I'm sorry to hear that you're unwell, and um, I'm sure our listenership uh, sympathise. Maybe. Maybe. Then it's just mostly <laughs> for the coughing, because I know that's not nice. Yeah, okay. Well, nice. I don't know. As long as the uh, compressor dips a little bit, otherwise everyone will be deafened by your death rattle. <laughs> Come on, then, let's get through the questions. What have you got for me? Business stuff. Uh, managers. Oh, yeah. How, when do you get a manager? That's a big step, isn't it? I think it is, yeah. It used to be like um, one of the priorities early on. Is I think, that before um, you did the partnership agreement? We did it, we had that in place before the partnership agreement and then like it was either the first or the second thing that, that our lawyer was obliged to take care of, really. Um, because I think the first thing is to establish the entity legally formalize everybody's roles and you know the directorship of the companies blah 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 and then you look for representation and i think that's what some people call their their managers their representation i think in that in that instance like the role of the manager is to sort of be a buffer zone between the creatives and then the business folk you know so i think it's like um I think ideally they 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 take all of that all of those negotiations away from you and there's a lot of stuff that happens between them and promoters and so on that you're not even privy to or you shouldn't be privy to because it can that's that's the sort of thing that can really um sour the experience when you when you realize the nuts and bolts of what's actually happening around you know within the infrastructure of a band itself and around it that can be a little bit um the wrong kind of eye opener yeah, and there's a lot of it's a lot of admin. Like you guys, your job is making music, so you can't yeah. be doing admin, really. And also, yeah, it makes you feel bad because you're representing yourself as a person to other people. And then if you have to be the badass in a thing in a negotiation, it mm. will reflect badly on you. So yeah, exactly. So PAs I mean, a lot of people, and there's a lot of sort of different management styles, really. Um, I did see one manager that's sort of like a. It was somebody that I was writing with and um, their management had like a little strap line at the bottom of their email and it said, uh, manager, creative and all that. And then it said, and friend. <laughs> and I was like, a professional friend. That's saying, I would not trust someone who said they were a professional I, friend. I don't think that was a good manager. I think I would prefer if someone said, your enemy. Or, Cause I'd or be like, like Let's um, go. I'm a real asshole, but I'm your asshole. That's what you want. You know, the guy with the cricket bat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That wasn't the word that. I'm, <laughs> this is me watering it down. I'm uh, your asshole. I, I'm your asshole. So I didn't really understand where that sort of friend is is appropriate, really, because um, there are managers that really care about their artists, and you know there are managers who only care about money, but they're the same person. You know, they're they're doing the same job, really. Like if you care about your artist, you're going to get as much money for them as you possibly can. You know, like a manager's whole raison d'etre should be to make their clients rich. You know, um, some of them are super proactive and they have ambitions and big ideas and and they're all about sort of gaining momentum and then maximizing opportunities and all that sort of stuff. And some of them are just like, just to try and keep, keep stuff away from the band. It depends on what you're looking for and how ambitious you are. What was your first manager like? Did they make, did they help in your success? What did you say? Your first manager, did they help it to your success? I think we had a lot of power in those days and we were, we were quite close-knit and loyal. So it was, um, all the momentum that we gathered was from like, you know, really good within London strategy and, and like that successful kind of residency approach to the way we did gigs and stuff. So by the time it was necessary to have representation between us and labels and stuff. We had all the power because it was quite obvious that we were going to be successful, you know? Do you know what I mean? Like there was all the, all the momentum was, was heading in the right direction. Labels could see it. 
So, so you would have made it without a manager. You just needed them to work for you rather than because some people think they need to get a manager to become successful. Yeah. yeah. Um, the best managers in the world will tell you that if you are looking for a manager who is going to make you a star and says to you, oh, I'm going to make you a star, you know then at that point that they're full of shit and they're definitely not going to be the right person because managers today, they know that it's uh, what you have to manage is momentum. You know, it's not, you can't, there's nothing you can actually do to predict. All you've got to do is be there to, to sort of protect your client from, you know, the pitfalls of the music trade and you know and also success as well and like be around to to support emotionally when the trauma of success kicks in but do do they have to be your babysitter as well do you have to be wrangled by a manager to do what you need to do i think that's the sort of thing that a manager would delegate actually because i I know you're talking about like getting you from one bit of promo to the next and and all that sort of stuff yeah and getting you to do all the commitments i guess not even promo like Rehearsals, getting, getting the gigs. gigs and stuff. Yeah, even just writing sessions. Anything. Yeah. Being yeah, because uh, this is the thing that I've noticed on this channel as well. Like, um, when, uh, because I'm basically just a singer, <laughs> you know, and if I'm trying to put together like a, an interview with somebody else who's basically either a singer or a guitar player or something like that, um, the conversation goes like this. Yeah, cool. I'd love to come on the. Um, like, come on the channel, that'd be brilliant, yeah, awesome. And I'll be like, I'll be like great, yeah, you'd be an excellent guest, yeah, and, and our lot would love it if you came on. And then the conversation about dates starts, and I go, what about, um, you know, Wednesday the whatever of whatever, um, and then just I get ghosted. <laughs> That's what happened, and it isn't because people are flaky, it's because, like, as soon as you, as soon as you rely on a creative person for a date, they're like, uh... Yeah, they they freak out. They you freak know. out with the deadlines. Except for Richie Cotton. Yeah, Cotton. genius. And, you know, what a guitar Very player. organised and very prompt with his emailing. Because obviously you passed that on to me and I was just dealing with Richie. Yeah, there are exceptions to it. I mean, me and Michael Starr were trying really hard to organise a thing and you had to step in and do it because <laughs> we were just two singers. <laughs> that was the issue. You know? Just two I'm singers. I'm just used to that. Well, I was a PA for a while. Right. That's, so that yeah. was my job. So, I mean, I think management, you're talk, all you're talking about there with the wrangling is diary management, isn't it? Diary management, but also there's a lot of consider, considering what you need to do, you know. So you have to like weirdly have to play this game of wanting, serving the person you're working for, but also making sure they do things as well that they don't want to do, but they want to do. So you're serving them, but you're also trying to make them do things. Yeah. And then it becomes this weird power battle between you and the person you're working for because they're like, I know you're trying to get me to do that thing. And you're like, yeah, but you want to do the thing. <laughs> and it's like this weird mind game. And then you're trying to fend off everyone. Everyone used to try. Brian Bay came towards me to try and get Russell. That was my first Who interaction did? with him. Brian May emailed me. That's when. so weird because Pete Mallon on the phone right now. He's trying That's to call weird. me. That's so weird, isn't it? That's weird. I'm going to have to quickly text him just to let him know. Hang on a sec. I've met Pete. Yeah. You met him at Queen. Yeah. <laughs> and we were having cheese and crackers outside the tour bus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, go on. So, what are we talking about? Um, yeah. Brian May was trying to get to Russell through me once. What was he trying to get him to do? I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was something to do with badgers. Um, yeah, probably. And he was like, from one May to another. And I was like... Where, where did Brian May come uh, from? Brilliant. And I remember being like, I don't want to let Brian May down. <sighs> and also, you didn't, did you not want to, you didn't want to let him know that it was, May is your like, second yeah. part of your first name. No. Did you, did you correct him on that? <laughs> that would have been no. a really pedantic <laughs> move. <laughs> no, I was just happy that he was emailing me. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It was before I met him, obviously. Yeah. We just have nice awkward interactions, it's fine. He's the best, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to awkward interactions. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember my favourite thing about Brian May is, um, I mean, there's a million things that I love about him, but I saw him like with some reading glasses on the end of his nose and he was sending a text message walking along the corridor 
of a venue with a glass of wine tucked in his elbow. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think he had socks and sandals on and was bumping into the wall because he was like a little bit drunk and trying to send a text message <laughs> whilst walking. It is um, difficult to do. Well, it, those are, I mean, think about all the different things he had to consider then and he was drunk. It was just like... It's really just impressive. best to wait till you find a seat to do a text. I like a sit-down text message as well. Yeah, yeah. you really get into it. You yeah. sit down, cross your legs and lie back and then you start texting. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've noticed. Just, it's just nice to take a moment because it's <laughs> respectful to the person that you're communicating with. But did you ever have a PA? Um, well, we sort of have, we have things like band assistants. You know, like um, there's usually somebody that tries to coordinate stuff for us. Um, been through quite a few of those, but, but mostly their job is to sort of <laughs> keep the um, costumes clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Um, put on your mic pack. Yeah, that can be. Make sure your dressing rooms, your riders. Yeah, it's room. more like just sort of making sure that we're all happy. That's a PA job, but just a, on tour. Yeah. I also but um, Joe does that, and she's like um, just a, a reassuring presence in a dressing room, and you know everything's done because she's doing it, and she's brilliant. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't describe that as PA stuff. I mean, she's a very capable person, and I probably could use her in that way. But um, nearest thing I've ever had to PA is you, probably. <laughs> well, I always fall into manager PA roles. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I always have tried to push away your PA tasks on me. You like doing You'd be those, like, yeah. you, you like, do this thing, and depending on what it was, I'd be like, yes or no. <laughs> or I'd just ignore you, depending on what it was. Well, I know if it's a no, because I just don't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just get nothing back. <laughs> Will you do this thing? Okay. Yeah, but I'm like, why? I'm not your <laughs> okay, I'll ask, I'll ask for something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it's got nothing to do with my actual job. Hey, everything's our actual <laughs> job. It, 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 isn't it? You're like, can you email this person to get me this thing? I'm like, why don't what? Yeah, it's nothing to do with the YouTube channel. Well, can you? <laughs> and then just like, <laughs> I did do something really good. Yeah, I can't, well, I can't remember what it was. Yeah, oh, it'll come back to you. No, <laughs> I got sorted out your paintings, your Vic Reeves. True. Okay. True. Which resulted in him visiting you. Which resulted in in you guys doing a video together. So that's good. Yeah, I pa that's good. Yeah. I PA'd um, that bit. So you PA'd the shit out of that. And I did some probably things with clothes. Probably. Yeah, probably. But um, but yeah, usually there's... I think when we were successful, I think there was like... Um, our manager had, a, had an assistant. And then also a, a sort of band assistant sort of... I don't know. We've, I've never had a. I don't think I've ever had a dedicated individual PA. You don't need one. I don't think I need one. Yeah. And but I know. Yeah, I don't know if that's a thing that sort of applies to mu the music life, really. No, Aside from not. sort of, ma you know, diary management is the most important and difficult thing to do anyway. I think. You know. Yeah, I definitely did that for you. I think. Yeah, um, but I mean, I think it, even like. From a managerial perspective, it's difficult. It's, you know, structuring tours, promo scheduling, all of the things that I put in my diary or you put in my diary. You know, I think it's, it's particularly difficult for them because I've got two different careers <laughs> running concurrently, and it's difficult I think, to. Yeah, you know. I mean, it depends. It depends if you have a brain that's good with that. Well, obviously I do, but you know. <laughs> no, I don't mean you, but like the people doing it. Like if you have a good sense of... Also, I have that weird synesthesia thing where I see the days, the week and months. Yeah, um, you, they're, they're different. <laughs> when you see a day, it's a different flavour. No. Like for example, Monday, was it tastes like um I egg. don't have the taste one, no. <laughs> what, what I don't have to, it's called <laughs> synesthesia. It's just... <laughs> synesthesia is when you... Uh, synesthesia is when you um, do, can do, taste colours and you can hear shapes. I mean... It, no, it's the neurons that, that deal with senses are a bit messed up and crossed. Some people have taste stuff. Some people have color stuff. 
Yeah. I have I have number lines and calendars. I listen to music and I see colours. Do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes. What colours? It depends on the music. Is it a note? No, I think it's to do with like... Um, then that's synesthesia. You're always picking on me for my stupid number line. That's because um, I'm projecting. Yeah. But, you know, I think if you close your eyes and listen to music, I always thought that was just a normal thing to sort no. of have a hue that emerges. and. Everyone thinks it's normal. I thought everybody's numbers were in certain places. And my friend is the one that figured it out for me. <laughs> what? Do you mean no, you think numbers are in certain places? They're in a certain place. Seven is here. Ten is here. They have a, they've got a number line. Starts at zero. Zero. One. Two. Two. Then ten. Then there's a little loop up. Then we're in the teens. And then it goes up to 20. Then it goes across here. This is 30. And it goes over here. I, I'm reminded at how <laughs> bad you are at maths. <laughs> <laughs> and how that's oh, yeah. your actual weakness do you know why now because I know the, why the numbers the, are stuck because you're looking at every, every time I, I ask you to do a simple calculation you're like <laughs> that's because the numbers are stuck they're static you're like trying to move them around I can't move them around ah that's why you can't actually put them in a position where you could do yeah. the calculation when I try and do it like move them off the number line as I put them in my brain in front of me. <laughs> can you stop calling it the number line? That's what it's called. You can Google it. It's on Wikipedia. Uh, it's the number line. It's holding can, you back. It really is. I can't. I'm hardwired with my number line. And where, depending on what age I am, that's where I am on the number line. <laughs> so I see, I see the world from where I am. <laughs> so you get to like 13 and then when you're like four. When I'm 14, I'll be round that bend there and just on yeah. the next plateau. That's exactly what it's like. Is it like You're a snake, all, like this? Everyone's number line's a different shape. No, it's oh, really? straight. And then it goes up, then it goes like this. I'm here now. You're all the way over here. What, because I'm <laughs> further along the number line? Uh, yeah. <laughs> when, I pick, when I think of you, you're over there <laughs> by 48. 28. <laughs> then you're below me which yeah no alright I don't know what that's got to do with music business but it's Makes a good fascinating PAs. insight into how bad you are at maths and why and now you have synesthesia but why do you hate synesthesia <laughs> oh well, well no, I just hate it when people go on about stuff like because it's all just like you know you know what I mean it's just I've never met anyone who has it has the, the colour one. I've met a million people that say they've got it. And I oh. always thought it was quite normal with the music and colours. I think the taste one is the weirdest taste in names. Because some people, when you say a name, they get taste in them. Yeah, I can imagine that being That's weird. unfortunate. Because then they but can't that, have friends. That, but that's got to be something else. That's, that must be some sort of association, mustn't it? They they can't be friends with certain people. Because if they're friends with Kevin and Kevin tastes like shit, which does happen. Yeah. They can't say their name ever. Because then their mouth will be full of... That the taste. taste of shit. Yeah. Okay, so the music business <laughs> is littered with pitfalls and you need representation to protect you from it. In summary, yeah, what was <laughs> ignoring your... the rest of that bullshit. <laughs> that happens. I'm sick. I yeah. can't help it. No, I, I understand. It's all right. Thanks. Can't. When? What, well, then, what, who's, have you had bad managers? Um, haven't, you been, like, haven't you been screwed over before? I don't think we've ever been ripped off, you know. It's not like, it's not like the 50s anymore. I mean, I do, I do hear stories about people who, who um, have kind of structures in place that where there's no transparency and and the managers... Uh, I mean, you, you hear about... like what I think the way it used to be, it would be like a manager would come up to you and they'd go like, uh, don't worry, uh, I'll look after your money and uh, make sure you're all right, you know. And then they would collect everything and then they would do some sort of vague calculations behind the scenes and they say well after my deductions this is what you're left with and but but now it's kind of different I've get, uh, the the artist will bring in the money or the the touring company will bring in the money or the other the license holding entity will bring in the money and then any sort of commissions that are paid to managers will happen after that you know it, the, the thing i want to say about managers is like is, there's a slightly different um, traditionally, like an American manager would take 10% off the top of everything. So like if you did a gig for 100 
thousand pounds, um, your manager would get ten thousand pounds. If you're a four-piece band, that means there's ninety grand left over between you. Now, what does that work out as? Um, okay, I'll tell you. It's twenty-two 24. and a half grand oh, each. I almost got it. Okay, twenty-two and a half grand each, but. With that American management system, if there are a lot of costs involved, like say you spend 50 grand on pyro, that leaves 40 grand for the band, you get 10 each if it's a four piece. Um, then you've got the overheads of accommodation, transport, whatever else, you know. You might find that the fee um, leaves you, as a band, each after commission, each earning less than the manager does, you know. So they but, should take it after... Um, expenses well I mean that's the way you do it in England like in I think most most of the time in Europe you'd have like um, most managers are on a bit more like so they're on 20% but that's after some reasonable expenses like so if you do spend 50 grand on pyro then a four-piece band and the manager would each make uh, 10 grand at the end of that day if it's a hundred grand day see what I mean it works out really well. Like the, the English way works out really well for four-piece bands because it means that the manager um, is earning the same as the band. And so you're all in it together. There's never any kind of, oh, but you made money and we didn't kind of thing. You never get that. Everybody, everybody wins together and loses together. That's, that's why I prefer the European way because, because I'm in a four-piece band. Well, the US one seems a bit stupid. Well, it isn't, though, because... Um, like if you want to spend all your money on 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 a on a pyro show, why should the manager suffer? But usually <laughs> the manager is involved in everything, right? Like if you're in it together. Yeah, but the manager will advise you not to do that. The manager's the manager wants you to be rich. The manager will say, "Don't spend all your money on pyro." Well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> you know. Apparently, Lady Gaga. Did I tell you that Lady Gaga's tour? Maybe it was the one you were on. Was the, one of the biggest tour uh, most expensive tours and she only started earning after six months after doing six months of touring she she was in the red until that that's how much the overheads were but then really? as soon as she started making money was that the born this way one then i think it might have been yeah that's so much we were stuff on. and then it was once, spectacular i mean a lot of rigging yeah and then after that they earned loads of money but it took six months to pay off the but tour. they were playing <laughs> that was playing in stadiums in a lot of places and yeah. At the very least arenas. We we did Twickenham, Stade de France, a load of football stadiums in in South America. It was huge. That was a massive. The touring, the, they're earning so much in touring there. They're earning like six hundred and twenty five million. I think was Taylor Swift. Yeah. In this tour, that's insane. Because the ticket cut prices. Ah. You can't charge that in South America, though. I think they're trying to start to, but you know, hmm. I know this, they shouldn't. I think I did see someone say they dispense like so much of their. I think some of the tickets are five hundred dollars in South America, which is ridiculous. It's better than four grand. Though. What was that? What was that? Oh yeah, there was one that went to twenty-two. Yeah, she she just put tickets on sale now. Actually, yeah. I still think that that needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. Even though you know, young blood. Oh, is it young blood? Yeah. He's trying to keep his ticket prices low. He's trying to figure out a way to go around all these things. <laughs> what things is he going to go around? Number lines. Ticketmaster and Live Nation and stuff. Yeah. He's going to, but then they own the venues, so. Oh, you mean he's trying to circumnavigate that yeah. so he doesn't have to deal with them? Yeah, because he won't earn any money if his ticket. He's trying to charge only like twenty quid for a ticket to see him. Yeah. Oh, I see. So he's trying to sort of cut out. Well, how do you, you can't charge twenty quid for? They won't let you, will they? If you did a tour and you're like, we only want to charge twenty quid, would they let you just charge twenty quid? I've no idea. I've never asked actually. Because the the fee they want to they want to earn more, right? Well, the thing is, oh yeah, okay. But here's another thing about the business side of it. If you're an established touring artist and um, you want to do a tour of the UK, um, you would probably be looking to have like the same promoter for most of the venues there'll be a couple of exceptions like nottingham rock city and um, anything in scotland they'll have a different promoter but the rest of uh uk you'd um you'd probably be looking to work with live nation or aeg presents um and they would structure a deal where you 
have a guarantee like so even if you sell 10 tickets you're going to get this much money for a show if you sell if you hit certain targets like if you sell like 75 percent of them there might be a a bigger a number that you earn and if you hit if you sell it out then you get a special bonus um but they are taking a chance on you so they need to shift the tickets they need to they need to price them so that they they get remuner yeah. remunerated for their belief in you um and they're t they're basically they're fronting you some money at the top of the tour so that you can actually advance the touring by you know booking hotels and tour buses and stuff like that so yeah. that's different i mean because that, that, that you you have to sort of oh, no you have to you have to trust them to a degree in terms of like what they think they can sell because it's just based on their experience isn't it and they'll where what kind of rooms they can put you in how much they can charge for a ticket what they expect to make and what they can pay you and they're they're basing that on analytics from the last 50 years of touring arts you know but do you, th do you think that there should be a cap the f music fans shouldn't be charged hundreds of pounds for a ticket so I mean the dynamic pricing thing we talked about that before didn't we it's a little bit like if there's a lot of demand for a flight then the ticket yeah, but, to get on that plane is going to be expensive it's, isn't it but it's kind of reverse it's kind of annoying because it's like if there's that much of a demand you'll sell it and all the tickets should just be 50 quid yeah because yeah if you're that popular it's yeah. fine you know like Taylor Swift could just charge 50 quid it would sell it I think Taylor Swift has really upset you with this thing because you've mentioned yeah. it a few times not just today that's because her tour has just gone on and I keep seeing videos of people trying to buy tickets no but not, not just today I've, I've noticed that you've <laughs> talked about it a few times <laughs> do you think I hate Taylor Swift no I don't I think you're um, like a massive Taylor Swift fan <laughs> and I can't make it <laughs> and you're a bit cut because you missed the first wave of tickets and now you've got to pay yeah. four grand. You're more of a fan, I... Uh, I do like Taylor Swift, actually. Uh, I get it, but I don't get it as well. Yeah, I get it. I get um, why people like her. There's a... My, my daughter loves listening to Taylor Swift. And, um, yeah, some of her songs are catchy. So Blank I think, Space. I think, good I song. think she just announced that she's going to play in Zurich and... and um, wants to go yeah I'm sure it'll be very good that's going to be a great laugh and the, and the thing I said was like um, yeah you can go but you have to make me a cup of coffee every time I ask you for a cup of coffee between now and the show she does it anyway though but now she knows why she's doing it <laughs> <laughs> that's alright yeah you that's could right. Yeah, it might cost me four grand if I'm not quick you know I don't know how you much probably, it's going to be probably missed out already what? You've probably missed them already. If uh, anyone from the Taylor Swift organization is watching, I would love two tickets to the Zurich show. Um, hit me up. Put that in. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Do people just fan fancy you as well, I guess. That's not why Men. I like it. Men. That's not why I like it. That's not why I like it. I like it. Cause <laughs> why did your weird, vo your weird I, pair of voice come on? Like she dresses in like a sparkly, glittery one piece and she's got legs. She's got legs. She, does she know how to use them though? Yeah, she's always marching around, isn't she? I was doing a ZZ Top joke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I just get annoyed. I just think music shouldn't cost that much and it's like the only... It's the thing that unites everybody and then now it's becoming a rich person thing. People spending a month's rent. But that happened to football... Yeah, I also think, don't get me started on the football thing. I think that's stupid as well. Hmm. I think it's all bad. We talked about it on, when I was on that football podcast. So you think it's anything that means, anything that takes, anything that outprices the community that it was designed to serve in the first place is what pisses yeah. you off, isn't it? Yeah, especially football, because it's like, that's your team. And what, you've just spent hundreds Yeah, and usually money. it's like, it's to do with the community <coughs> around it, isn't it? It's, it's the local... Yeah thing right yeah and I if I was playing music and I knew everyone had to pay hundreds and hundreds of pounds to see me I'd feel bad I'd feel very bad yeah I, I gotta say like ticket prices until in fact throughout 
I've never been aware of what people are paying to come and see us. I've never actually known how much a ticket to a darkness show costs. It's usually about forty pound to right. fifty pound. It's actually quite reasonable. <laughs> I think. I'd like to think that we're doing a reasonable price ticket, but I've never actually. No one's ever said anything to me, so I suppose that, like if no one's ever complained, it's kind of like well then. There's no reason for me to know. And then even your VIPs are, are really cheap. When I heard how much your VIP ticket was, I was like, if, you might, if you're going to do the VIP, you might as well charge it VIP price. <laughs> it's still cheaper than most people's gig tickets. Is it? It's uh, like £75. <laughs> this is good value. <laughs> the thing about the VIP, though, it's a little bit like a Patreon thing, isn't it? A little bit. It's not as much of a dedicated community vibe, but it is a, is a way of sort of getting to know your audience it benefits us not just because of the money that they're paying, but there's something else special about it, isn't there? Isn't there? Yeah, there is. So it's talk about how it's bad as well. Your friend Matty had a big rant about it. And what did he say? He said, if you want to charge I like the way he's my friend shit. Matty now. <laughs> <laughs> your, your mate Matty. <laughs> your mate Matty. You should ask him for his ex-girlfriend's number to get tickets to see her. Ex-girlfriend? I thought they were yeah, just starting going out Apparently time. they're not going together anymore. Unless it's a big secret. Why is the world of celebrity romance so fast moving? Because it's too much aggro. And also creatives are always breaking up all the time because they're volatile and they can't maintain relationships. Apparently. (laughs) From what I've heard. (laughs) That's why I don't have any. It's just easier. It does sound a lot easier, actually. But I've never felt happiness. more alone than when I've been next to someone. But when I'm alone, it's fine. When you say next to someone, is that how you describe being in a relationship? When I'm next to someone. Because <laughs> yeah. mm. you always have that weird tension thing, especially if you're creative or emotionally emotional. You're an emotional person. I, d- I wouldn't know. Just... You're full of them. You're a big I am a business. I'm a person with business acumen and nothing more. <laughs> That's why I'm the ideal uh, individual Manager. to discuss the pitfalls of the music trade. Yeah. Just trying to take the emotion out of it. I mean, that's that's really what you're talking about. When you're talking about business, that's what happens when the music stops. <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. what this episode should be called. Justin Hawkins rides again. Jaws of victory. Pitfalls of the music trade. Business. What happens when the music stops? Is that good? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or does yeah. it sound more like we're talking about retirement? Um, or like, cut uh, like a a cutout at a gig or something. You know, like everything shuts down. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> so basically, the after show. <laughs> yeah, the after show. When the music stops, drugs. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when the music stops? Um, four men who have just deafened each other stand in a room in their pants, shouting about how great or bad the gig was. This is true. And that's basically what happens. Yeah. yeah. The, the, so the post-mortem is always excruciating. When, you, when, when the music stops and you go backstage, and I, I'm, I'm the only one that's on in-ears, so then I take my... And I've had my ears all protected, and, and the others are literally shouting at each other, and they can just be saying something as simple as like, sorry about that chord I forgot, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And, and I'd be like, yeah, but... And I try and I try and interject, and then I so quickly realise that I'm getting shouted over. <laughs> but they have they have earplugs in. I don't they think do have um, them. I don't think all of them use uh, moulded ones though. I think Frank Dan is on does, some generics. He? What's that? Dan has moulded ones, doesn't he? Yeah, Dan's very careful with his hearing, but he is standing right next to a really loud amp. And also, I, he gets, sometimes he's very I excited sort of wander in front of it, and it's like, oh my god, I can't be here, and then I go back over there. But he's in front of that thing for the whole gig, so no matter how much he thinks he's protecting his ears, he can't be. It's no, so loud. I've, I've, my ears have been sore after filming those gigs, and I have earplugs yeah. in. When you're at, when you're in the pit, if you're in front of Dan, it's it's got to be so loud. It's really loud. Yeah. He can't hear you. Yeah, I know. People <laughs> on that side can't hear me. So that's, why, it's like, that's why I always go over there and sort of give them a wave. It's like because I can't hear me. So I am singing. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, no, it's, it's just, it is working. You know, but the um. Yeah, I feel, I feel really sorry for people on that side, but at the same time, it sounds incredible. But that's that—that that, that is the difference between an old school band and a new school band. There's hardly any sound coming off off the stage in a new school. They're band. Near, they're all on in in, in 
in in ears. He stands the... side stage at most gigs now. All you can hear is the drums. Uh, so yeah, I think someone I think posted a video on TikTok where someone's phone went on stage. Mm. So they're at the gig and it was really loud, and then the phone went on stage and they, there was no sound. Yeah. Because everyone was on in ears and they. But you do that at a darkness bit. concert. It's just <laughs> deafening, and depending on where you're standing on the stage is what you're going to hear. You know. I think it was a Paramore gig actually. Oh yeah, they're probably all on in ears and and, and uh, amp simulators. There used to be a thing where um, you'd go to a gig and there'd be no amps on stage, but you know the guitars would still be playing through amps but the amps would be under the stage like if you do an arena thing why um to protect the hearing of the people on the stage and also like um the way it looks you know you can it do it looks more better with, with amps huh it looks better with amps everything looks better with amps totally agree with you but it is harder to play isn't it you're it's like just fighting. like yeah because you're fighting feedback and stuff like that but but as i've always said that's part of rock and roll isn't it and dan stays at the back of the stage too so he must be so deaf. Like he's not a guitarist who comes up the front that much. He does his little whoop whoop like that. Yeah. He, it's annoying when you're trying to photograph him because he just pops it forward a bit and then he retreats. Yeah, but I think that's <laughs> some of that's, it might even be like a bit of old school ACDC choreography. Like he'll come forward for a chorus, yell into the microphone and then uh, <laughs> get back next to his amp where he belongs. <laughs> get, get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. I like Frankie, though, because he always uh, gets in your way. Yeah, he does, yeah. <laughs> Frankie thinks he's the singer, that's the problem. <laughs> he starts coming no, forward and I cross. When he had the headset microphone, it was even worse. And I, and <laughs> came, at one point, he was like in, in this really cool, cool sort of 80s suit, headset microphone, and he was singing the backing vocal for Love Is Only A Feeling, and that, but singing it right at me. And, <laughs> and I couldn't keep it together. I was just laughing throughout like the second verse. It was just like... You can you get him a wireless bass as well so he can go everywhere? I think he's got a wireless bass, actually. Does he? Yeah. Because then he could go everywhere. He could go over to Roo. He's entirely he, wireless. Yeah. He can go wherever he likes. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> anyway, the Maddie thing. Mm, yeah. What did he say? <laughs> that if you want to charge your fans for being able to shake your hand, you should have to individually go up to them and say, give me your money and then shake their hand and see how you feel about it. Because you're looking your biggest fans in the face and, and charging them money to speak to you just as a human. And he thinks it's despicable. And they don't do those meet and greets. Because he says he can't face... Just that, that no, I think that's the only an, way. a really good and admirable viewpoint. But it's the viewpoint of somebody who doesn't need to do those things. Like yeah. a, a band at our level, to make a tour profitable, you need to do well on the merch and or you need to have some sort of VIP experience on top of what you're... Expecting but what about the, the big tickets. the big guys who are doing it who don't need it? Because there's a lot of bands doing it. Well, I think that's probably the the swipe that Matty's taking. Yeah, because a lot of people did say, oh, that's the only way we can make a few quid. I do, you know, I heard about um, a band that shall remain nameless, okay? Can um, you tell me? Huh? Can you tell me and I'll cut it out? you got to guess who it is. Oh. Um, so we did a VIP experience, and as you said, it wasn't that expensive, um, but it was enough to make the tour profitable. That was the thing. It was. I, f I think it's good for two reasons. It can take a, a tour that's in the red, put it in the black. Um, it can enhance your relationship with your audience, which is so important when you're a cult band like us. Like we're not, we're not a huge band, but we're doing all right because our fans understand that they need to support us and like so things like VIP they re they realize that that's going straight into our pockets and it's cool they they're really into doing it um what was it what was i going to say oh yeah so this band that i'm talking about a big band a legendary band do a thing where um the VIP experience involves you know the usual stuff photos you get sound check you can get access to the front row and all all the things that you, that are good about VIP anyway and then um <laughs> and then the additional thing um, was a guitar, which is, I would say it wasn't a guitar that was made by one of the premium guitar builders, um, but, you know, like one of the kind of the budget range of a premium guitar builder. I don't want to be any more specific than that, but it was a cheap guitar <clears throat> played for one song by the their hero and then sold to them for about five grand which is a you know that's one person in in that vip group would pay that much money 
for that guitar, which is probably something that retails at about 500 bucks or something like that. Um, but because they played it and signed it, that's that's the VIP experience is have a photo, get a guitar. It's uh, five grand. Who is it? You have to guess. Aerosmith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that already? No, they just loved it. It's three grand to do their VIP. Uh, how much is ours again? 75. Band. Okay, but I think in terms of like the how big the bands are, that's about right, isn't it? Yeah, I've seen photos where it's Stephen and Joe just like doing that. Yeah, <laughs> but that's just like um, then you. But actually, you just have your picture taken like that, and then they superimpose you onto the same picture of. <laughs> yeah. Because just getting Stephen and Joe to do that together is is that's. That would cost more than three grand. There's an the on stage tickets as well, like at the at the Vegas shows. So yeah. the one I went to, because I went out like last minute to see them in Vegas. Um, there's seats on the stage, basically. Oh. Like there's a little barrier. They cost a couple of grand as Did, well. Uh, in the Vegas shows, do the lights go down? Like, is it proper like house lights go down kind of show, or is it all lit? Because I remember seeing no, some footage of that, and it, it just was seemed dead. like there was some sort of hen night going on and oh, I was beside a hen night what I was, besi- I was beside yeah the, I feel uh, like it's going to a, uh, going to no, a it sort of Vegas it's residency like... show is a bit like a hen night kind of thing it was the worst crowd I've ever seen in my life mm. I was in the very front pit so they have the stage and then they have that triangle bit you know and then he walks to the end of the triangle and then there's oh. more. I was in the triangle with like about 50 or 60 people it's pretty cool uh, it was a bit weird. Um, it was cool, but there was a hen night, and then there was some stockbrokers, and then there was these two Aerosmith fans. Did I tell you this already? They were like proper hardcore fans. Everyone else was like, "We're in Vegas!" Like I yeah. don't even know if they knew. And then Stephen asked the guy for his hat, the hat, the fan, hmm. like, and he took it and he put it on his head hmm. and like sang a song with it. And then he wanted to give it back to him. So he threw it back to the guy and the stockbroker guy grabbed yeah. the hat and refused to give it back to the guy who owned it. He was like, that's my hat. And they're like, no, it's ours now. It's like, he owns the hat. It wasn't Stephen Tyler was trying to give him his hat back. You can't oh. just nick a hat because Stephen Tyler had it on his head. It's not public property. And oh. they were like proper fans as well. And I was like, I hate these people. I hate these people so much. That's really arsy, isn't it? And the crowd's weird because they're just like on a Vegas night out and... I they were, I really enjoyed it. I thought Stephen Tyler sounded amazing, mm. and he really puts in every energy he can. Yeah. Joe Perry's in his own little world, uh, just playing guitar solos. Mm. <laughs> but it was a good show. But the what was um, like, I, I think one of the unsung heroes of Aerosmith would be Brad Whitford. He's the bassist, one of my favorite guitar oh, no, the guitarist players. with the beard. Yeah, he's good. But he's just in the. He doesn't really come forward too much. He's at the back. Yeah, but I just think his contribution to that band is underrated. And I think that's probably because he doesn't look quite as good as Joe Perry without his shirt on. Yeah, maybe. Joe Perry and Stephen were that weird, had that weird relationship of like. Yeah, Mick always, and Keith type vibe. Yeah, they're always like singing into the same mic, and Stephen's always won't, invading his space all the time. <laughs> yeah. Basically, but it was a good show. It was just, and then walking around Vegas afterwards because I went on my own and mm. I came back out of the Vegas thing and I was trying to find the Judas Priest show because I got... Out from the uh, frying pan. <laughs> because, and I was walking around, everyone's in flip-flops. So I was like, oh, I'm dressed in this full mm. double denim outfit. And I was yeah. like, I'm in the desert. What am I doing? I, no, I'm you were out to there to rock. The and thing. I got loads of compliments because everyone was like, nice jacket because it was the only jacket in yeah. Vegas. <laughs> oh, right. You got and the then nicest I got an, jacket in Vegas. I Ubered to the Hard Rock Cafe and then snuck in the back way because I knew who the roadie was mm-hmm. and caught the end of Judas Priest, who were really rocked out as well. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah. I'd love to go and see the priest and Aerosmith, actually. It was a good night. Yeah. You it's know, very um, weird, though. I, met, I remember when I met Rob Halford at, um, I think it was one of the Kerrang Awards, and uh, it was the first time I'd ever met him. <laughs> he came over to me and was like, um, Hey, up, Justin. Oh, uh, no, what, what would his accent be? It's, it's Midlands, isn't it? How does he go down? Anyway. Middlesbrough? Ca- what? Is it a Birmingham accent? Yeah, Birmingham accent. All right, Justin, how are you doing? All right. Like that. And he came over to me and gave me the biggest, wettest kiss on the mouth. <laughs> it was like really slobbering, amazing experience. 
And I was like, wow, I've arrived. They had, they had I think, about 25 roadies, 30 roadies for that show. Okay, but what did, what did he come amazing. on with the um, the motorbike and everything, do all that? Yeah, the motorbike, oh, yeah. Yeah. So they might have yeah. been mechanics and... And, and like, get lighting guys, because I stayed... They asked me to stay afterwards, and I was just surrounded by loads of Birmingham men, basically, <laughs> in, like, black. They're the best kind. <laughs> yeah. Love it Birmingham men. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're good. They're nice. <laughs> but they, the... Well, it was the VIP thing, basically, I was talking about. Yeah, what was... Did you do the VIP uh, no. Judas Priest? No, no, I just had... I what do they call the, that, VI Priest? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I bumped into all those roadies stereotypically at the Rainbow Bar five days before. I know. I was waiting for my cousin. Yeah. And they're like, we would just happen to be in Vegas at the same time they said, come to the show. <laughs> if you just hang around on your own long enough, people just invite you to things. Yeah, that's true, actually. Because <laughs> you seem like a lost soul. Yeah, I was just like... Especially yeah. if you're wearing actually... double denim all on your own walking around Vegas. Of course you're going to get invited to stuff. But people are like, please, come to this thing because there's air conditioning and somewhere to hang that jacket up. <laughs> it was very hot. I forgot I was in a desert. Mm. I stayed in the pyramid to forget. hotel. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> you do. Yeah, I do. I'm not even kidding. But, yeah, it was fine. Okay, come on, give us some more business questions. Well, the one of them was, like, what is the most lucrative thing a band can do? And the other one is, like, about the worst managers but you've had to get rid of managers, haven't you? But maybe don't talk about that. Yeah, I mean, our first manager. Um, this is what I was talking about before. Like uh, we had to, we. She actually stood down, and I think part of that was because, like, um, when we sort of we're, when we would had that year when everything went right and we were having hits and number one album and all that winning prizes she felt like she had all the power in every sort of negotiation that, that was to be had. Um, and then when the second record happened, it was kind of like, I mean, it sold a million copies. I, I'd give both of my eyeballs to have a million selling record now, but you know, f compared to the first one, it was not as emphatic. Um, the label thought that the one after that was gonna be like the biggest record ever, but we split up obviously. And um, but before we split up, um, she stood down, and it was kind of like because she was going into meetings and recognizing that she was being steamrolled, and didn't feel like she had the power to represent us anymore, and just bailed on it. Is that is that good or is that no? Lazy? That's it's that's laziness. Awful. That's really really bad because it's you know at that point you just take the fight to them or you look elsewhere for a, for a label partner where you can actually have those conversations that need need to happen you know to for everyone to be happy you know you don't just duck out um just because it's too difficult you know um and i think the other the, the reasons why we've changed managers uh, as many times as we have is because like the the landscape changes and then and i think one of the one of the management teams that we had um was really was ready, was ready for the fact that nobody buys records anymore. They they saw that coming, um, but they were already acting like that was the case. And you know, the whole thing was about content and giving music away and all that stuff. And it really didn't sit right with us. Like we just weren't ready for it. We was we were too old school. And they're actually very forward thinking. I think they they probably had some solid and and you know now time proven ideas about where the business was heading. Um, we weren't. We just didn't want to hear it. I think we were in denial, actually. You know, we thought, oh, okay, this is just a blip. You know, of course people are still going to buy records. What are you talking about? But they were right. They were completely right. Um, and we were, we were like, um, what? Giving music away? Music that we've sat there and toiled over and recorded and all that. And they were right. To just giving it away. Yeah. It was such a. But that was a really difficult thing to just come to terms with. And and they were like. Um, trying to educate us and we weren't having it. We we're so old school. I mean, I still think we're, you know, we're a bit rubbish at all that stuff. We still haven't, we still haven't <laughs> adapted to it. We, our current management will never sell us out. We've been working with them for longer than any of the other managers. Um, and, you know, they haven't been at the helm for our most successful period. But one of the most important things is like stabilizing 
uh, businesses, the two businesses that I mentioned before, and making it so that it's robust enough to withstand something like a global pandemic. And they, that, and if it hadn't been for the work that they put in to just, you know, they, we, we wouldn't have made it through that. We'd have been bankrupt, and we'd all be doing different jobs, you know. And a lot of bands didn't make it, did they? I mean, pandemic killed off a lot of creative ventures and was empowering for some people and devastating for others. But you know, because because we'd steadied the ship. Um, we were okay, and it's actually that's actually because of the quality management, like making sure that all of our partners were infused and um, motivated, and and just making sure that when we're on the road, it's cost effective, basically, you know. But I think the pandemic has amplified the new way of doing things as well. Yeah. So definitely, it's weird. I know. Yeah, you need. And to it educated a lot of people as well, you know, like just as to how. To monetize the musical existence when like when a huge chunk of what you would traditionally consider to be your earning potential vanishes so like yeah. oh it's really really annoying because like music uh you know recorded music you you can't expect to earn off that unless people are streaming your stuff in the millions and billions um and then live music stops as well <laughs> oh shit, yeah. now what? and now everyone but everyone started com- consuming it for free online and made those people who did that during the pandemic got publishing deals after the end of it who'd never written anything a day in their life that pandemic created stars that people didn't people they weren't probably even doing music beforehand and they were like i'm just gonna give make all this music for this these people who are watching me and now all those people are going to those shows and stuff and yeah why are you so opposed to it what what do you want to do why what's your barrier my barrier what do you mean do you have a barrier between the old school way and and figuring out a way yeah, to do my, things now? Yeah, well, yeah, because I, 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 it's taken me a long time to understand the difference between content and art, and it was always something that didn't sit right with me. I always thought like when I was growing up, say for example, let's let's use the cult as an example. They wouldn't be doing videos of them farting in the kitchen or whatever the fuck it was. (laughs) You know what I mean? They they would never do any sort of behind the scenesy stuff. They'd be mystique and it'd be an aspirational vocation. It's all the things I always talk about. Um, And everything that they would put out would be art, whether it's a video. um, Some videos aren't art, though. Well, now that's true. Well, even then, they're just performance videos. But even then, it's art, though. But is it art, or is it just content? Are you just it's showing art the because song? it's an interpretation? I mean, it, it would be like a okay. So, I think the cult did do some really brilliant performance videos, and it's like empty venue, them strutting about, showing you what you get in a show. But it's still art because it's. But that's what people do now. I think there is still art versus content. All that behind the scenes stuff. Some people do it. Yeah. You don't have to do it. No, but I think that's the thing that we were finding difficult. Like, we didn't want to just show all that stuff, you know, because I don't I don't think any of us had any desire to share those sort of behind-the-scenesy stuff, you know, like, because the whole thing about what we're doing is, like, there's a scene and our audience is on that side of the scene. Why, why would we want to be inclined to show can, what's behind it? You know? But what, the behind the scene can be a different version of a scene. It doesn't have to be real. It doesn't yeah, have to be true. It can be I like... Think, okay, but I don't think anybody said that to us at the time. You can like create whatever mystique you want. And yeah. do, content is one thing, but yeah. you can make your content art also. Yeah. And a lot of content is Well, the people who do art. it brilliantly can do that, you know. But you've got to be fully invested in that. And that isn't what we signed up for. I mean, you've got to remember, like, I'm I'm 48. Other members of the band, not no one in particular, might be a little bit older than that, you know. Um, and the reality is that that's not what we signed up for all those years but ago. When you, yeah, but when you were doing all that business stuff, like going to meetings and making plans, and that's... That that's what that this is now. It's just a version of that. Yeah, it's just a necessary evil to being a, a business entity. So you can complain about it all you want, but hey, you won't. You'll you never won't hear make, me complaining. That's the you one won't, thing. If you want to be able to run a successful business, yeah, alongside of your art, you're gonna have to, the business has changed. Yeah, and you can say, oh, it doesn't mystique, it, lacks, it lacks mystique, but all that business stuff is boring and takes the fun out of the art as well. 
It's just mm-hmm. a new kind of version of it. Because people are always like, oh, I don't want to do that. And they're really disparaging of certain ways of working. And it's like... Well, I think so. Another manager said to me um, that there's a constant battle that's that every creative person has between burning ambition and uh, uncompromising authenticity. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like... You just have to pick your battles with those ones. If you want to just be an authentic artist, you shouldn't make money from it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just yeah. don't charge anything. Well, what are you doing? Why are you a business? Why do you have two yeah. businesses, publishing and touring? So that you don't have to do you, other. So you don't have to do a real job. You don't. Yeah, but then you you can't then go. Oh, I'm an artist. I can't do a behind the scenes. I know. That's video, that's, like, that's why there's bus- always a battle. It's a, yeah, then you know. you're a businessman though. So which is it? That's why I sometimes get frustrated when I'm working with people. Like, well, which is it? Either you don't want to make money, or you. I think that's why I like Patreon because it is the old. It works like the old, like Mozart, for example. Not not to compare myself to Mozart, but you know, like the way those guys sustained themselves was there were people who were patrons of the arts, who basically forked out and accommodated them and helped them with whatever they needed, and just allowed them to live a life that that was um, well, conducive had, to writing music. You know? But things like, I think, Michelangelo and Leonardo da, Vin- da Vinci, they had to do things they didn't want to do, apparently. They had to paint things they didn't want to paint because their patrons were paying, giving them all this money. They had to do sculptures. No, and they didn't. Yeah, really? they did. Yeah. Well, I can double check it, but I'm pretty sure they, they got all the person giving them loads of money. If they go, I'm, I want you to paint this, they're not going to go, no. No, but they weren't, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't, the patrons weren't commissioning them to do anything in particular. I think, think sometimes they were. Wasn't this? Well, isn't that? That's a different. That's a different arrangement. I'm talking about patrons, true patronage. The, uh, yeah, but they were, That's what the true patronage was, wasn't it? People no, who that sounds more like artists. commissioning an artist to draw a picture of a bloke with his knob out, or whatever it is. I'm sure it was a bit. I, of I'm a huge thing. art enthusiast, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more complicated than the. All right, bloke with his knob out, and then another. Bloke, I mean the patronage and then the, the thing. Fingers are touching or something on a on a ceiling. Is that it? What are you talking about? <laughs> a couple of blokes with their knobs out. All right. Okay. Okay, no, we'll stop saying that. <laughs> Why do people want to make it as an artist? What does but what does make it mean? I, I never really make, understand. Make that. a living and become this an artist that people recognise and listen to. Oh, okay. You like mean this is a, b- become famous. <laughs> well, I feel like that must be in the back of many people's minds, if they're being honest with themselves. I, do, you know, if it's the fame thing is only cool, like if you're trying to get your mum to understand that you've achieved something. Really. I think so. Not my mum. So if you were starting as but an But one's mum, you know. What would you want to achieve in the next, like, six months? Me? Yeah, if you were just... Fuck, were... that's a really good... Um, <clears throat> that's another thing. Like, managers, I suppose, and, and the businesses are there to try and help you achieve your objectives, but you have to have them in the first place. Like, um, so six months. What do I want to achieve in six months? Um, are, you, are you asking me for real? Yeah. Um, okay. Or if you were like hypothetically starting out as an artist. Yeah. What would you want to do? Okay. Well, if I was starting out now, I think in six months I'd be like, I want to have, I want to have like, um, I want to double the number of uh, monthly listeners that I have on my streaming profiles. Uh, I want to put a song out every month, and I'd, I would, if I was starting out now, I wouldn't be interested in doing album cycles, as and as, as a body of work, I'd be drip feeding a track a month. <clears throat> well, why don't you do that now? Um, because uh, I don't know. So to sum, yeah, in summary, a, I would say it's about business and managers was mostly the theme. Yeah, I feel like. Um, Compartmentalizing the the musical existence is really important, but it shouldn't be your job to do it. Uh, a, a really good lawyer is the first thing you have to get, even if you're not operating in the states. And I know the states is a traditionally litigious country anyway, and it's a difficult business to navigate without 
I mean, you you got all sorts of things like trademarks and and the the the, the American trademark laws are really complicated because it's to do with like um, the name and your logo type and also like the area of business that you operate in, which can be multi multi uh, multiple uh, areas of business, can't it? If you're talking about merchandise and all the all the sort of things that you might find yourself doing as a as a as a band or a musician, is the darkness t- trademarked? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, huh. yeah, you have to do that sort of stuff, you know. It's, um, so I think for people who are coming up, I think it's really important to find a brilliant lawyer. Um, it's really important that you and the lawyer um, find a brilliant uh, manager. And a brilliant manager isn't is never going to tell you they're a brilliant manager. <laughs> so you're just going to have to try and find. Well, what out. are the traits of a brilliant manager? Pardon? What are the what are the traits of a brilliant manager? Loyalty, um, unflinching um, support, artistic guidance. It depends what you want from them, really. But the the most important thing is the you can rely on them to represent you. So it's, it's got to be someone like-minded, really. You can't just be a, a guy with a cricket bat. It's got to be somebody who um, loves you, believes in you, and you love them back, and, and you're all in it together. It's just another member of the the band, really, that doesn't play an instrument but kicks ass. What are the bad traits? Huh? What are the bad traits? Um, the thing about being a manager is that they're going to have to tell you bad news sometimes. You know, sometimes when things don't go your way, they're the ones, they're the bearer of that. So you need somebody who's prepared to tell you stuff that you don't want to hear. Um, And it can be so unpleasant that you dislike them because of the thing that they're saying to you, you know. And sometimes they're so frustrated, they take it out on you. It's just like any relationship, you know. And there's going to be bumps in it, you know. There's there's always going to be, if you have a, a... you know, one of the things about manager is you, you you've got to choose them carefully because there'll always be some sort of sunset clause. So when you decide not to work with that person anymore, you still got to pay them on the things that were exploited during their term. So like if you release a record, goes to number one, you can't just sack your manager and not pay them. They're going to have to earn on that, you know, because they deserve it. So it's really these are difficult choices to make, and you've got to think carefully about what you, what you actually want them to do and how you want them to represent you. And, what what are you going to use them for you know um so manager is important lawyer is important i think in america there's a whole other load of stuff you have to think about like business managers and people that you never even meet but they're doing a lot of number crunching and applying for visas and all this kind of stuff there's a lot there's a lot to think about but at the core of it it's manager lawyer that's that's what you need yeah we didn't get on to publishers or anything yet no but we could do that another time i think publishing is a whole other world really yeah, publishing and songwriting. Yeah, publishing is the songwriting side of it all. And for me, that's the most exciting. It's the best. Because yeah, it's, it's like about it. the life of the work itself and it's got nothing to do with... And the money. What? And the money. Well, I mean, yes, there, there are some advantages to it. But, uh, that wasn't what I was referring to. <laughs> no, I, I like it because it's about music and it can't be about anything else. It's the best part of it. Yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do a whole episode on that, I reckon, because I could... I'll ask you more questions. You could ask some questions about it and I'll answer them. Because I think I always ask you questions when you do it in, in real life about that stuff anyway. Yeah. I'm like, why does that work? Why did you do that? Why did you do this? <laughs> when it was about, <laughs> I'd be like, like can you some... just do some PA stuff? <laughs> Shut up. <I'm> like... <laughs> can you just serve me rather than talk to me? <laughs> do the things that I ask of you. Right, play that A again. What A? You know I don't know anything. You know what an A looks like. This one? Justin this one? Hawkins rides again. E minor. Is that E minor? That's major. <laughs> e minor. Is that E minor? I can't hear it. Again. That's it. You got it. So yeah, well done. Business. Business. And that concludes our business chat.
Thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, did you enjoy this kind of episode? Is it is the business side of things something that interests you? Um, we'll do more on the business side of things if it is uh, something that you'd like us to do. Because um, there's always more to say and it's, uh, as I said before, it's a constantly evolving landscape that um, artists are obliged to try and navigate. So if you want us to unpack a bit more of the business side of it, we're happy to do so. Let us know in the comments. Um, and in the meantime, see you next Monday. Cheers. Okay.